Yeah. But at least I, I have them up. On, I'm putting it up on YouTube, and, I, and I'm putting the links up in the class there. If you want to look at them at all, you can always go back. And I've been placing them here in video lectures. So you're welcome to go there. This is the initial one. I had to put two there. Actually, it's not MP3. It's, an, it's a WAV file there. Here's the lecture from last time where we talked about our prelim preliminary investigation report. So that's part of my channel. I have a YouTube channel. And I have one of my biggest videos, I think I have uh, 200 hits about that Excel crashing. So that link is there. And then always check this for your assignments. I had noticed the due date in Moodle or eLearn was wrong for this case sim. So I have updated that. It had been set to the 23rd. And according to our assignment schedule, which is still uh, subject to change as we go, we have it due tonight. And Mike, I saw you already turned it in. You can still edit it if you have any changes. But uh, I took a quick look at it, and it looks pretty good doing the that first assignment listed right down here. Yeah, I, I modified that. I didn't realize it was only online. So if you want to do it online, I, I just modified the settings to allow either an online edit or upload a file. And I'll try to do that uh, in the future. Oh, now it says it's overdue by nine hours. Let me fix that. I thought it was, let's see here, settings, assignment settings. And here's where the system has the due date. Oh, look at that, due date for almost 1 a.m. I will change that to 11.55 p.m. today. And since I didn't enable the cutoff date, it's still let you submit it. It'll just show me that it's late. And so if I have the date wrong, it'll, don't worry, if it shows late, don't worry, I'm going by this assignment list. And so there, we'll save that setting. And uh, so from what I saw so far, it was pretty good. Pretty, pretty straightforward uh, listing of uh, generally we'll probably agree that uh, we should have a systems review committee. But uh, the key thing I'm looking for is being able to specifically say the reasons. And don't be afraid to present the argument, no, we shouldn't have one. Here's the reasons we don't want one. We're too small a company to need one. Uh, the schedule is, uh, there's too much politics going on, and it's all going to be run by one person anyway. It's a waste of time. I kind of lean towards that as much as I can on meetings, just to kind of be a argument for, hey, let's make sure the meetings are efficient, or it's going to be a waste of time. And, of course, it's just fun to argue with people sometimes. I thought I would do... Uh, do a little review. I like to look for little video links. I may actually have this one in the class, but I thought this was a good one to kind of just review our uh, methodologies. And this guy does kind of a good good job. He has several decent little videos. And let's just play this one. It's only a little eight minute talking or just reviewing our life cycle approaches. Let's see here. Where's my play? <laughs> I'm Tom Hathaway. I'm wearing my BA hat, so let's talk business analysis. In this nugget, we're going to talk about business analysis and system development life cycles or system development methodologies. We'll discuss which methodologies exist currently and how these methodologies impact what you do when you are the one wearing the BA hat. A software development life cycle, SDLC, aka SDM, or software development methodology is a workflow for delivering and maintaining an information technology solution. Basically, it consists of a set of activities, tasks, or steps that create now one or more needed deliverables this, so or artifacts, i.e. a requirements document, a training program, a database design, the program code, etc. The ultimate deliverable of a methodology is a deployed or installed solution including manual and automated components, that its intended target audience can use. 
As a business analyst, you're a major player in the process of defining the solution. Therefore, you need to understand how the methodology influences your requirements elicitation, specification, and documentation. Each type of software development methodology handles changes in the requirements over the life of the project differently. How do the different methodologies affect your requirements definition efforts? As the individual responsible for translating business needs into requirements at various levels of detail, you will be involved in specific aspects of the project at different times and at different levels of intensity. The major differences have to do with the level of detail of the requirements, the timing of the requirements analysis and specification activities, and the form in which you document the requirements. The three different types of methodologies currently in use are structured, iterative, and agile. So we're doing just Actually, there is a fourth parts. approach. The ad hoc, aka chaotic approach, assumes you have very little knowledge of what you're doing or how to get it done. This approach is essential when a revolutionary new technology is introduced. There are no clearly defined activities or deliverables, and work progresses in a whatever-needs-to-get-done flow. As a side note, the method is often disparagingly referred to as the Cal-Tal-Pal approach. Code a little, test a little, pray a lot. <laughs> Since little is known about what needs to be done when, requirements activities tend to be ad hoc, spur-of-the-moment tasks that seldom involve a full-time business analyst. Often, the need for requirements is not obvious until a fully developed solution a lot of fun, fails though. to meet the customer's needs. Changing requirements often lead to considerable unscheduled rework in this approach as the customer rejects one solution after another. Due to its lack of definition, this approach is seldom referred to as a methodology. <laughs> Structured or waterfall approaches apply a rigorous sequence of tasks and deliverables to the process Familiar? of delivering a solution. The, waterfall. the tasks are typically subdivided into phases such as planning, analysis, design, development, testing, and deploying. Each phase creates a major deliverable, i.e. business case, requirements document, design specification, etc that can be evaluated by the appropriate authorities to reach a conscious decision whether or not to continue with the next phase. The original SDM that was developed in the 60s and set the foundation for future methodologies was called the System Development Lifecycle, or SDLC. Following that philosophy, in all structured methodologies, the analysis phase is primarily the responsibility of the business analyst. During this phase, requirements are elicited, documented, analyzed, and specified. Once the deliverable of the analysis phase has been accepted, changes to the requirements undergo analysis based on a rigorous change management protocol. The business analyst is typically a member of the change review board. Due to the challenges and associated costs that changing requirements posed to structured methodologies, the idea of iterative development emerged in the 70s and 80s. Iterative approaches assume that while the overall project goals and objectives remain relatively constant, the development of the solution will cause the needs to change, and that will require modifications to the delivered solution. Iterative methodologies break the tasks of delivering IT solutions into smaller chunks and break the project into a series of releases. Each release provides a piece of the final solution that the user community can use. Subsequent releases morph the solution to add features and functions that will ultimately lead to a complete solution. Typically, iterative methodologies divide the tasks into four phases, inception, elaboration, construction, and transition, or some similar names. The inception phase is the initiation of the project and only occurs once. The remaining three phases overlap and are repeated for each release. Most business analysis activities will take place during the inception and elaboration phases. Because iterative methodologies deliver the final product over time in a series of releases, the focus of the requirements is release specific. 
That means that while the business analyst captures high-level business and stakeholder requirements for the project in the inception phase, detailed analysis and specification of the requirement is done for each iteration during the elaboration phase and focusing on the requirements for that release. The Agile approach is a child of the 21st century. It takes the iterative concept to the extreme and assumes a state of constant change. Agile projects manage change by maintaining an ongoing communication between the kind business community chaotic. and the developer community. It recognizes that requirements cannot always be defined at the beginning of the project, but need to be re-evaluated and refined on a daily basis. Many Agile approaches are in use today. One of the most popular is the Scrum approach that involves brief daily meetings to discuss progress and establish expectations. An Agile team consists primarily of developers and representatives of the business community. It includes a full-time business analyst if the complexity of the solution from, warrants it. Otherwise, the product I've owner, with, developers, and testers wear the business analysis hat when and where needed. High-level business requirements need to be articulated and agreed upon before the project can be initiated. Specific requirements in the form of user stories are analyzed and specified immediately before developers need them. Documentation in Agile projects tends to be minimal and are sometimes discarded as soon as the immediate need is satisfied. I like that part. I don't like that. As the BA, you will most likely not be able to select the ideal methodology for your project. However, you should be aware of how the selective methodology influences your business analysis activities on the project. I thought that was a pretty good summary of kind of what we should know so far, but uh, kind of reviewing that kind of gets it in your mind. He, this guy has several videos I'll, I'll uh, review and maybe kind of use as just a way to kind of refresh our memory of this whole system. You want to have a good idea. Be able to. You should be able to explain to someone these general concepts by now. Just kind of the the approach to the project. There's various ways to approach solving problems and developing a solution. Uh, the chaotic approach is the most natural. But then, as you develop experience, you will just say, build a, yourself a way of, of approaching a problem. And that you can see as you get more people. Rather than making them go through chaos and figure it out themselves, presenting this kind of approach to a problem just is a seems like a more efficient way. And of course, the agile. What were the what were the different types of approach? There we go. Iterative and agile. I'm not quite sure. How does right now? How would I how would I describe the difference between agile and iterative? They seem similar to me. Basically, does he does he make it clear what agile the difference between agile and iterative is? And they talk. This guy talked about changing requirements, and maybe that was that not so much in, uh, emphasized in iterative. Oh, okay, that's iterative where you've got changing requirements, which is pretty realistic uh, as the technology changes. Nowadays, thinking of a software project that's going to take more than a year. There's a lot of software things that change in a year, uh, like Flash projects. Um, three years ago, Flash might have been more of an option. I think now Apple's kind of killed Flash, and then maybe there's been some major developments in Java or Ruby or some other structure. Maybe maybe Eclipse. Your your uh, this is what happens to me. I'll be doing a little project. And I'll come back in a year to, to work on it some more. And Eclipse, the version of Eclipse has completely changed. And I think, okay, I want to keep up to date with that. And suddenly my project won't compile anymore because Eclipse, 
the software development environment has completely changed. If I were doing this as a project, at some point I have to say, okay, here's my software development environment, I'm sticking with this. We can't change halfway through or we'll, our project will basically restart. But we're dating our project a little bit, saying, okay, this is compatible with Eclipse, cert certain version, which may say, okay, it can only go up to, say I'm doing it for a mobile device, I can only support up to Android 4.8. And after that, we're going to have to come back and revisit that. You, your, your development environment affects your market. So, and it's moving pretty quickly, especially in software. So if you're in software area, that's a scary place to be. You've got to keep up to date with the tools and the language. And find a language. I think Java is probably more stable than, say, an, um, I'd say Ruby might be a little more, more of a, in two years, Ruby's going to be a lot lot different or uh, HTML5 or Silverlight uh, where there's new versions and may suddenly break things that you had working from the start and that gets into your more the further along on how on choosing of your platform once you've designed your system so looking at our plan now planning to now go through chapter 3 looking at concepts having to do with managing projects and let me pull over my excerpt my book pages from the online book kind of looking at the start what we're going to be thinking about here in this chapter is the management of projects looking at tools for project management which uh, there do you know let me zoom in a little bit on, do you know of tools for project management yourself You know of any tools that you'd use for planning, scheduling? Maybe. One of them that I want you to be familiar with that managers love is called Microsoft Project. And we can install Microsoft Project and actually use that. There are cloud based uh, Gantt charts, that's a big part of scheduling. It's kind of a way to uh, kind of break break down your project into little little pieces, and then put and then the, the software actually puts them together and lays out a schedule. All you have to do is uh, break it into parts and give reasonable. Hopefully, as you get better at it, you give more accurate estimates of the time required to do various things. And these little scheduling tools that generate little Gantt charts, it's like putting it on a calendar and seeing how it'll flow and the important thing is is identifying do they have that here identifying the uh, critical path which means the the uh, short the things that are going to take the most time that are going to determine the ultimate time of your project they would call that the critical path so learning to use one is I think I kind of enjoy seeing what's out there. I found several and I think I have links to it over here in the in the course for project planning and some of them I think are up at the top here. Let's see here. Here, Open Proj is something we've used. Uh, we have Project Manager, we have Ganter. These are the various tools that uh, we're going to explore and I actually, let's see, we have Project 2013 that uh, even if we end up using one of these others, we may want to actually uh, install Project Microsoft Project 2013 and get and work on that. And that's something if we uh, we may actually do today, if we uh, get through some of the basics here, kind of reviewing the the term on, terminology for this chapter. So knowing these terms, remember we've got to learn a lot of buzzwords in this course as well. Dependencies, durations, dates, end dates. You want to learn all the terminology about these charts. You want to be uh, familiar. When you look at a chart, say you're doing an interview, you see on the wall a Gantt chart, you could look up to it and say, oh, uh, what are you doing with that Gantt chart up there? Are you doing, running a project? And they'll say, whoa, you know what you 
what you're doing. We want to hire you right now. Especially if they're a manager. So they love looking at projects. Because they don't know the, the deep down code. Their concern is reporting to their bosses, are we on track? And so the ones answering to administration, are we making project? Are we, are we going to have the product delivered at the time we promised? These charts help the managers to be more confident, yes, we're on track. And if there's a change in one little task inside of here, they can adjust the change to that track, uh, that particular task, as they talk with the developer or with a supplier saying, hey, there's a 30-day delay on that part you need. Makes it easy for someone to say, okay, part delivery went out 30 days. We estimated 30, now it's going to 60. Put it that up in your Gantt chart and see how that affects your schedule. By if you've carefully created your, your scheduling chart, you'll immediately see, oh, now there's a new critical path because we have to wait for that part to get in before we can get started with that task, which other tasks depend on. This kind of software can really help make clear what's, how that will, a particular change will affect your project. And if you have something like this, seeing that a particular part being delayed affects everything and you've missed your, your target date because of it, then you can put pressure on the supplier, hey, I really need that part, or pressure on your, your uh, purchasing person to be willing to pay more for it, to get it there, there on time, or to send a manager to the supplier say, we need this now because it, our main project is depending on it, you're going to lose our business if you don't do this. Without charts like this, you can't convince someone, hey, that's a, that's a problem right now when someone takes a vacation or we can't hire someone or we're not willing to pay the higher price for shipping or whatever it takes to keep things on schedule these kind of charts help you to manage all that now depending on where you are in a project like the uh, like at the start of that video the guy said at some point you may be involved in a project like that in some way or another and they showed that person, I think around here, he's talking about, yeah, you're going to be involved in some way or another. You may decide you like the project management. You may be a developer. You may be a supplier to someone. Understanding how this all works will, and knowing the terminology will help you better uh, fit in with that project. and. Even if you're not the project manager, you can help the project manager do their job better. You can understand why they're obsessed with the chart or why they're talking about each task and how long it's going to take. They, have, they need to go back and plug it into the, all the complex things that this software can handle. And remember, we're talking about complex projects, not just one, a one-person small program, which you may be involved with, if you're depending on your your uh, employment most of the time though having these principles in mind even with small projects will even help your individual things happen you can even apply these kind of ideas into your current uh, scheduling of things just kind of get get good at it and it'll help you even organize your your normal life laying out schedules and things which is something I still need to learn to do something you want you kind of want to avoid because it takes a little effort to to put those uh, schedules down there so those that that's the goal of chapter three is understanding our project management tools uh-huh Uh, yep, two backslashes. Would you like to go and install Microsoft Project and just you know start that out? That's probably a good good software to learn. Let me uh, go through. I I don't know if it's installed on this PC set yet, so I'll uh, I'll go through it on this one as well. So let's see here. I got to bring up Notepad here, and remember, Project is available to anyone in the CS program. I think any student at Emmaus. 
I'm not sure the exact rules of the agreement here. Let me get Windows Explorer up here and I'll show you the mapping and make sure it's here. I believe we have it here. So I have on my local drive, uh, where do I have that? Let's see, I have a shortcut to my downloads. Underneath the Microsoft downloads, which, just for a note here, I'll just put the, the uh, map is 10.128.7.98, that's this machine here, and then it's public. And then it's login is instructor W8. backslash and then student and then password student that should get you in and then underneath there you should see let's see here we got project professional 2013 right there what I would do is copy that to your desktop first then when you're installing it oh wait a minute I think we can mount that ISO if we have to, I can burn a disk. Um, yeah. Yeah, I see just, I only see the one project. If there's a later version of project that you find, this one was downloaded almost a year, more than a year ago, but I think we're still on 2013. I don't know of a project. 2015. Fortunately, I don't I don't have access to the uh, MSDNAA stuff right now. Let's see if I can I open can I mount let's see if I can mount that. Looks like I can mount it and just run setup. That's kind of nice with Windows 8. Now let's see if let's see what happens if I run it. And I I believe that key is still good. Yeah, it's doing the install. accepting the terms and I like to customize let's see office shared features let's see what they are proofing tools is not included in the standard install I'm not sure what they are but I think I'm gonna tell it yes I want the proofing tools installed rather than waiting until I want them Look at the space it wants. 1.4 gig to install project. So I'll copy over the ISO and then right click mount. Yeah, just launch the setup once you mount that ISO. It'll go faster if you have it copied first than if you try to do it over the network. And I'm not sure how long that install takes. So while that's installing, we'll come back here and how about we take see how well we could do on the flash carb project for this chapter. Let's see here. Online companion. Let's try the online companion. See how, how well we can do on the terms before reading the chapter. Yeah, you can open the terms page. Let's try it here. Okay, so learn it online. Chapter 3. Uh, Isaiah said he had a problem with the flash working, so I said, well, go ahead and do one of the other end of chapters. Uh, I don't recall having an issue once I went through enabling the Java. Hmm. See, I get this, and then I say run.
and I'm using Firefox, but uh, Mikey, you said Chrome has worked for you? All right, let's try 12 cards for each. And the name, what is the date? The 29th? All right, I'm not going to use the book. I should know some of these terms, but you know, the old gray cells. Who handles, is this a who? Handles administrative duties for development team. Who should we start with? Who wants to take that one? All right, Mike is going to try. Coordinator, project coordinator. Look at there. Two points for Micah. All right, Hannah. Project planning software. Uh, what's it called? That sounds pretty good. Oh, 2007. Sorry. <laughs> Dates the book there a little bit, doesn't it? When did when did 2010 come out? Boy, this is version eight. Maybe we better update the book. Concept says adding people to a late project makes it later. Uh, concept. The Mythical Man Month is a book I that talks about this. That adding more people, they it's a myth that it makes it happen s sooner. It does make it more complex. It does help adding people if, if they do it right. I'm not sure what the concept is. Let's call it. Any people the late project makes it later. Uh, complexity dilemma. Oh, it's probably Brooks Law. That sounds right. Yeah, I get one point. You're ahead of me. Okay, back to Micah. Task that takes place after another is completed. Think about terms around tasks. Any idea? Milestone? I don't think so, but give it a try. Oh, I was I I was close. Task group? Final answer. Can I go with successor? I think you're right. I was thinking dependent. All right, Hannah. Analyzes a large complex project as a series of tasks. Still a little mysterious there, isn't it? What? These two look pretty good. And maybe there. Bert, I think you're right. Yep. Task that must be completed one after another. I'm thinking this must be dependent. I'm thinking dependent tasks. Let's see. Ooh, look at that. Three for me. Okay, Micah. 
Most likely time estimate. That sounds right. The Gantt chart gives us the tasks, but it's not estimating the most likely time. It's get, it's basically calculates based on what you've entered. All right. The creation of a project timetable. Hmm, that's a pretty abstract term. Could be a lot of things. See how my installation's going. Oh, my installation's done. Hasn't asked for a key yet. All right. Yep, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's it. Yeah, some are very general terms, some are more specific. Code that provides unique identification for a task. Task ID, ha. Huh. Process of analyzing risks to minimize their impact. What'd you say? Punting? Oh, thank you. Want the list? All right. Analyzing risks. Risk analysis. Yeah. All right, Hannah. Work that has a beginning and end and uses company resources. Hmm. Should have been looking at the other options. They were probably in the other options on those other. The list. I have a feeling it's a very simple word. Let's see. Yeah, I think so. I was thinking task, so I would have got it wrong. But activity, I think it's pretty much it. All right, this is. I think this is the last one for me. Tasks that can be started at the same time, parallel, concurrent. What should I go with? I'm gonna say parallel. Concurrent. There we go. So we got 100%. Way to go. Kind of a fun way. Just to kind of get thinking, uh, as we look at the book here, remember, uh, I'm looking here on page 105 as we think about what's happening here, and again, knowing the terminology. PERT charts are program evaluation review techniques. And interesting how the U.S. Navy is mentioned here as the first ones to develop that. Can you imagine how complex a project like 
construction a, constructing a nuclear submarine. I mean, we think about complex projects as you know something that has five tasks to happen. Just imagine all the parts, and a huge part of it at the beginning is, you know, especially you know the manufacturing ones, all the pieces that have to be made. In software, if you track your software carefully, and as I zoom out properly here so you can actually see, just imagine the number of tasks in a complex project like building a nuclear submarine. I mean, it, yeah, I would. I would bet there's subsystems that have their own project management yeah. beneath that. Yeah, and there's some there's some amazing documentaries about like uh, World War II and the people that were building ships, and they got that system down. I mean, there weren't perfect ships. There were ship, ships that were cracking in the middle of the ocean when they got cold and things, but they were turning out ships like in a month. A huge destroyer because they just had the system down they had people in there that were like uh, slave drivers and people that had built a few and realized the system they had these you know building parts at the same time in, in parallel and then welding these huge parts together to then put the final ship together where the wiring was already in and ready to go you can see this happening in, in construction where uh, you've got contractors and you see some houses go up pretty quickly. These franchises like the McDonald's, they come through, they have their crews. They've built 10 McDonald's already. They have people there that have been trained, uh, trained through the system. All their buildings are exactly the same because it makes it easier to go remodel one, you know, where all the parts are. Uh, Micah, when we did our little networking project, that company tried to keep all the wires going to the same places so anytime they they worked on a store they knew uh, slot number one in in the main in the big cabinet was a particular thing the network wire that went into port number four they knew where that went to the printer in the store or whatever and of course as I go in and we start documenting things you find well they didn't quite do it exactly that way in your crawling underneath dusty counters to find the boxes and at some point they're using the same label but it's like man this is crazy stuff but they were closer to then to to following the pattern than just randomly the chaos so these two things pert cpm the critical path method and let's now bring up microsoft project you have it uh, completed all right let's bring up a project and let's start just making a task and let's go Let's start with uh, just making the basic waterfall in Microsoft Project. And if you ever ask for a key, you have the key right up here. That key should work for you if you ever ask for one. And if you want Visio, you have that same ISO there. You're welcome to install Visio. So I'm going to see if I can find Microsoft Project. I have to go to my right corner. This is, I made this my main screen because the recorder will only works on the primary display. And that's fine. Oh, I could have just hit the flight key. So, project 2013. And the nice thing about this is Gantt charts and PERT charts are not just for Microsoft Project. Uh, there's online tools that nice thing about them, the cloud tools are pretty nice. You can have an account there and create uh, documents. Let's see here. How about we just enter the key instead? There we go. That's where I need the key. I'll go back and get my key here. Copy. There, let's see if it'll paste. Yes. Done. Well, let's see if I zoom out a little bit. Well, let's just do the start. I think it is helpful 
helpful little project. I'll zoom in a little bit more. There we go. So we're gonna we're gonna fill in our tasks. We're gonna adjust the hierarchy. Basically, coming to tasks, and we can tab them in by increasing their level. See how they they put this in, and we see that phase one has these tasks. We can initially just put them all in as task lists. Come back in, set their their uh, level, and then we can start linking them, saying what's dependent on what else. We can do it graphically by grabbing and dragging things, or we can edit the uh, the details, and then the graph will reflect that. So it's pretty nice. But I can edit things both graphically and in the details. So now let's go ahead and get started by just clicking on Gantt chart. They've given me a phase already. Uh, let's do a new one. Come on, this is this doesn't help. If it's already done for us, I haven't learned how to use this. So let's start a new project. Blank project. All right. So let's learn how this is done now. And they give us a little help here. We're going to first install our task names. So let's first look at let's put the the phases of our waterfall diagram so let's do planning and what do we do inside of planning let's put a few subtasks in and then we'll learn the whole subtask thing you can look in chapter one if you like for what goes on in planning uh, was that part of the well let's see we gotta get our mission statement we gotta have our company mission statement I have a meeting for that. We've got to uh, maybe prioritize. That may be analysis. No, I think that's part of the planning stage. We've got to prioritize. And the deliverable of the planning, remember what our deliverable of the planning phase is? preliminary investigation report, right? Look at that little waterfall. And I can grab columns at the upper gray and stretch them out. And let's see, anything else? That's the deliverable, so that'll be the last thing. So then we have the analysis phase. And since we haven't gone to that chapter yet, we can kind of make up some things. Uh, how about we review the PIR from the previous phase? We estimate costs. That's going to be happening regularly, probably in each phase refining the plan. Uh, what else in analysis? Uh, uh, somehow we an analyze a problem, think of solution. Hey, we got to hire a consultant and he's going to come and meet with us. So we get, we hire some consultant and we have a meeting with them. And the thing about this kind of planning, you can always plan a meeting and say it's going to take this long. You can throw that on your chart. It's hard to estimate tasks because it depends on the skill of the programmer. And they discover things. That's the craziest thing. You discover new problems as you're working on the task, especially in that world of the chaos in that first uh, little lecture men mentioning. The reason that you have the chaotic approach is there's new technology. You don't know what the system is yet. When you're doing something that's been done before or something very similar, you can get a better estimate of costs. So we'll just throw that in there. So then we have the design. We're not buying parts yet in the design. We are actually uh, laying out the how it works logically. So I'll call it, uh, we'll, be, we'll be doing some diagrams. Let's, let's say we're going to do uh, system What, what could they call it? Some kind of system diagrams. I'll just say system diagrams. 
We don't know exactly what, in the, in the design phase, you haven't actually decided what programming language you're using if it's a software project. You're deciding, here's what has to happen in the system, and that's where the system design comes in. Uh, you may be doing some object-oriented analysis. And I think chapter one kind of reviews all these phases and gives us analysis and gives us uh, the general tasks that happen in each one. Uh, there's prototyping prototypes. I think in the design phase we've done some we work on some prototypes. And let's see what else in the design. Oh, and we do some case use case diagrams that's right use case diagrams describing how the system will be used and with use case diagrams we're going to spend some time on this we have data flow diagrams we're going to spend a lot of time on data flow diagrams describing how we want or we need information to flow within our system and then once we are doing a lot of design, I forget the deliverable there is design specifications, I believe. And you can always look in that waterfall diagram for those main deliverables. Now we get into the implementation. That's the fun part. Where the plan comes together. And in there, then you're uh, designing components, uh, you've got meetings, uh, you're testing. So let's just call it uh, where you're getting down to the programs. How about uh, activities, uh, software, module, projects, or sub projects, or we'll call them activities where they take resources and people's time and you're then integrating multiple modules together this is where mechanically you'd be fitting the parts put building the final machine in software fitting the parts is integrating different pieces of software so you can see they actually are working together and on a nuclear submarine you would see does the power system now properly work and interact with the steering system that that's been installed those subsystems and then you have your working system how about no we have your beta version and a big part of the implementation is testing then you're delivering it to your customer your customer uh, approval and then operation or ongoing support there's training there's maintenance etc cetera, etc cetera. All right, so we list all our tasks. Then we can come back to the top and say, wait a minute, these, these sets of tasks here, let's see if I can do them all together. These sets of tasks here are all subparts of planning. So let's see if I can shift select multiple. And can I right click? I want to indent it. Maybe I can select that up here. Can I do that up here? I want to make it a subtask. It's probably one of these. Here, here, I think this is it. Let's try that. There we go. That becomes a subtask then of the one above it. And now these parts, drag, drag, drag. Those are subtasks. So it's a lot like a an outline. They become subtasks of that. And over here, in the Gantt part, I see the little bracket showing that that's a task. So I'll go through all my subtasks, 
indent them. And you can also assign colors to them. We can come back and assign colors. Implementation. Uh, there we go. That's implementation. And operation or on or I call it ongoing support. That's your customer has it and you're running. Okay, so I have duration I haven't figured out yet we don't put a duration here because we now come back and estimate the subtasks duration and as we enter a duration watch what happens I put a mission statement let's say we're gonna spend we're gonna spend a day off-site uh, deciding our mission statement once I assign a a time to it it becomes a little ribbon over here as a one-day task as I change my start date, choosing a different date, and my lovely little date chooser, say, okay, we suppose we started February 27th. My Gantt chart over here will move that little spot up to that part there. Now let's do prioritize. Let's say that's going to take a week of meetings. Now this is where you have to decide. Uh, schedule versus the resources and that's a whole subset where here we're saying it's going to take five days to finalize our prioritization but it may not be five man days of resources and that comes back later assigning resources so right now we're just estimating the time for that thing to have from the start implementation of scheduling it or calling it we're in, in the middle of doing that to finally have it done. And of course, preliminary investigation report will take not a whole lot of time, man hours, but over discussion and interviews, it'll let's just say it's going to take 30 days to finalize the investigation report, waiting for people to give answers to an email we sent asking if we could go to said have an interview with them. They're not available for a week, so that's we're not done with that till a week, but we may be doing other things. Now, with those three tasks, let's just say we can't prioritize until we've done our mission statement. How do we set that as a dependency? Well, there's two ways to do it. I can come over here and just say my predecessor here for this guy, for the prioritize, is task number two. And I just put a two there and hit enter. And that over here in the Gantt, I see that's become now pushed out. Now I can do it graphically. Let me see if I can do this now. I haven't done 2013 for a while. I think graphically I can just drag. Oh, there's a way. Let's see. Click there. I think I can click to there and can drag it to that one. Now there's a way to. Oh, that stretches it out. I can manually. I can graphically stretch it out. Oh, and I can crash project. Bye doing too much dragging. <laughs> Thank you, project. Okay, let's see. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Recent. I didn't do a save before I did that. I think I might have lost my work. Eh. All right. So be careful with your dragging. <laughs> and look at that, it doesn't remember anything I did. All right, first thing I'm gonna do, is save. I've been using my OneDrive a little more as we've got a faster internet to see if it works a little better than it was before. A Little bit of a delay getting to my OneDrive and I am signed in. So I got to go back and let's see. I'll make a CS four one two. And inside of there, I'll make a spring two thousand fifteen. 
I gotta start over here. I'm gonna, I'll just do that first part and, and then I'll let you work on that. So the planning was the mission statement. It was the, what came after mission statement? Prioritizing. And then it was a preliminary investigation. So we made those a subtask of that one by indenting that. Come on. There we go. Indenting that. At a scheduled date, we gave it a duration. One, one, five, and thirty. And instead of dragging, I know there's a way to drag, but since it died on me, I'm going to just put the dependency here for now. So the dependency of that is 2, the dependency on that is 3. It automatically pushes these out. If I adjust my prioritizing to take 3 days instead of 5, it automatically adjusts my schedule. Um, oh, look, look at that. It, it left that as starting as the initial date. I would... I've expected that to automatically pull that back since I didn't say there was a delay. It looks like at the point where we assign a, a time initially, it sets a fixed start date. That's kind of irritating. I want that to, I was hoping that would slide with me. Maybe there's a way. To the end of this guy, after I adjusted this shorter, I wanted this to have slid to the left because I could say, you know, I can start my investigation as soon as I'm done prioritizing. But see how that's stuck there? There's probably a way to set this to slide with that. Yeah. It, I think it will, watch, if, if I change this to six, it should push it out. So if I change this to six days, oh, look at that, it didn't push that out. That's interesting. Maybe there's a, oh, look at that. Manually schedule is set up. Let me change that to auto schedule. There we go. Auto schedule, turning on auto schedule. Now let's change that to three days. There we go. That's what I was expecting. So click up here. Make sure you leave it for auto schedule. Manual schedule, fix the start dates. And then if you tweak something, it doesn't adjust automatically. So. I'm used to seeing auto schedule, and I'm not sure why that got set to manual. So I'm going to save it before I get any further, just in case I crash it again. Because when I first came across Project, this was uh, a few years back, we did it all graphically. We could just grab a little thing, we clicked on here, and a little, you could just drag, and a little arrow showed up. Maybe if I drag the end, you could just drag, select the end, and, and a little, maybe a right click. Let's see, right click. There was a way you could just click and then a little line appeared and you connect it to another schedule and it would automatically make it a dependency on another. So I'll put in my other in items here and uh, basically set out a schedule and change the dependencies. And uh, at that point, you've got a project. Save your project for now and maybe we'll come back and look at how we can then plan resources, assign resources to the particular tasks. And to do that, you have to first create your resources, and then they'll show up in a list of available resources. So I'm going to come back here and oh, and look at that when I add a new project now. Because I hadn't first entered it, it assumes it's a sub-project of that one, but I can outdent it, and it becomes its own project. I'm going to bring up the 
book pages of chapter one, because I think in chapter one they kind of go through the different tasks rather than just going from memory here. Let's see. If I look in chapter one, I'm pretty sure they had given me a quick outline in the introduction to systems analysis. Tools. Remember what page the waterfall diagram was on? I think it was like yeah. t 20 or so. Here, I can go through these. So it has system planning, a system to request. So I'll put that in my project. So a system request, we reviewed that. Let's see if they have the analysis part. Oh, requirements modeling. So I'll put that in there. Requirements modeling. And just like it's very similar to Excel, I can right click on a row and insert a task and I think it'll insert it above the row I'm in. So you can always come back and modify your tasks. And so the system requirements documents is my requirements. Any delays I'm getting, I'm blaming on my OneDrive. If I see more delays, I wonder if my crash was due to my OneDrive. Let's see. No, I hadn't saved it yet, so I can't blame that on the OneDrive. Investigate business processes, logical model. So build logical model. If I just right click over in the gray, I get insert task. I think I can click in the gray and just grab it up if I have it in the wrong order. Yeah, it lets me do that. And I'm going to put these as part of the analysis. Selecting through, indenting. And then I can always come back now and put in my duration estimate. And that's where the meticulous discussing with people the tasks, assigning an estimated duration. This is the huge part of this, is getting close to accurate estimating of these durations. And you'll have multiple tasks and of course the, the task that takes the longest of, th of tasks that are in parallel becomes the critical path. And Microsoft Project will automatically highlight in red your critical path. So it's a pretty slick little tool and this Gantt chart approach isn't just Microsoft Project. It's any t any uh, project management tool will have the Gantt chart capability. So you're not looking at project necessarily ex exclusively. You're looking at how a Gantt chart is developed using Microsoft Project. I think initially Microsoft Project was the only tool that gave you Gantt charts, but be but after the success of Project, about every tool that does project management management you would expect it to give you the Gantt chart. And how it analyzes the critical path and things, that may change from software to software. But build a Gantt chart, get familiar with all these aspects of it, because every other project management, you'll it's very similar. They put they almost it's almost like they copied Microsoft Project. Because it's a, it's such a popular tool. So we'll stop there. Having learned kind of the the overview of that and now getting, in, getting into a little learning of Microsoft Project. And I will stop our recording now that it's both recorded, both microphone and the speakers. Boy, we're going to get slick at this publishing.